Welcome back to Switched to Linux. The end is coming, guys. I have definitive proof. Here's what happened. On Thursday, my data resets. As many of you know, I only have a 150 gigabyte data cap, which is insanely slow, I know, but welcome to United States internet. But on this Thursday, my data cap was set to reset, but I really only used about two thirds. So I decided we're gonna do system upgrades on everything we possibly can. Manjaro updated with only a very, very minor snag. The current version of Bluefish wasn't working. Very easily rolled that back, looking through the Pac-Man cache, run Pac-Man U and call the name of the version I want, roll it back to the previous version. Bluefish works great now, no problems on Manjaro. Endeavor OS, for the first time ever, I did not have a problem updating Endeavor OS. And then Linux Mint completely imploded. What type of backwards world is this where the one operating system that has never given me problems completely explodes on itself and the other two that always give me problems are working perfectly fine? If nothing else, it is the Ubuntu version of Linux Mint. Maybe this is that definitive sign. It is time to move to something like Arch for everything. <laughs> I'm being a little facetious. Um, in reality, what blew up on it was partially my fault, and I'm going to tell you where mistakes were made. You see, I had to run system upgrades on Linux Mint, so I ran all the upgrades. While it was upgrading, I got a notification that the boot sector was low in disk space. And like a, I almost said the R word, fool, I just went ahead and rebooted anyway. Well, the error on the boot, uh, if, your, if your boot sector gets to zero, it means your Linux kernel did not update and it's trying to update into a dead Linux kernel. Now, the way I have this computer set up, there's really no timeout on the grub menu and we could not find a good way to get into the menu to find an older kernel. Well, no problem. Of course, you just boot up your Linux Mint Live key and you have a, a boot repair kit. What you need to understand is that Grub doesn't generally like the NVMe SSDs. So it didn't find anything. Well, it did find something. It found the cubes disk. And then it proceeded to kill the bootloader based on the cubes disk. That was exciting. And so I couldn't get anything working. So I walked through a series of different steps and could not get this fixed. Now. Some of you guys that have been around Linux, you're like, oh yeah, this is easy. Blah, 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 blah. And I'm going to tell you, y'all are not right. Because there's multiple things going on at this point in time. And I'm going to tell you what the solution is, uh, because I searched for everything and I was able to find nobody that gave me the information I would need to restore a dead Linux kernel from Linux Mint running an LVM Lux encrypted NVMe SSD. And that's what we're going to show you how to do. I'm going to have all the different steps and my explanation in a tutorial linked here over on the website at switchtolinux.com so that hopefully as people start looking around for other solutions, you can start finding this as SSDs and NVMe drives are becoming more standard inside of computers. Hopefully this will help you if you are running an encrypted modern laptop get back your Linux because there is one more bug I have not yet resolved at least the way it should be. And that is auto remove is not clearing out the old kernels. I had a ton of old kernels. I actually had to go in there uh, into the boot drive and literally do pseudo RMs, which is not something you should be doing, but that's what I had to do to get everything updated. One of the biggest problems is that the uh, uh, 513 and 515 kernel are massive in size. And with only a 750 megabyte um, space for the uh, boot sector is what is configured in on the install, it didn't work. So let's go ahead and walk through my steps here. Now we are going to borrow from a few different things. I found a number of Ask Ubuntu, which put together various puzzle pieces. And then the last few steps were a little bit of logical thinking. 
So I'm going to be looking over this way on the newly fixed laptop. Uh, this is the laptop that was giving me the problems and uh, it is uh, completely fixed now. And I'm gonna walk you through what we did. So of course, if you jumped in, you said, well, that's easy. You just need to, you know, boot your, um, uh, boot your drive on and chroot into it and do a grub update. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you'd be wrong. <laughs> that's the right general premise, but there's a number of steps you have to do because this is, uh, this is an NVMe drive. It is Lux encrypted. It has logical volume management. So there's a lot of extra steps that are not on any one concise guide about fixing grub. And so let's go ahead and walk through our steps. So on the primary uh, one, how can I repair Grub? Um, and this related to getting Ubuntu back after installing Windows. Of course, if you do that, Windows installs its, uh, its um, a bootloader and its bootloader does not want you to boot Linux. So it didn't do that. At least it didn't in, I don't know, 2011 when this article was written. <laughs> but this is, you know, the relevant stuff you can find. So let's go with it. So of course they're going to tell you, you're going to boot into the live key, uh, or try Ubuntu. Sure. I did Linux mint. I had a Linux mint uh, key. This is actually Ventoy with a variety of different distros on it. I just happened to do the Linux mint. And then the problem is it is encrypted. So what we need to do first is we need to mount the encrypted drive. So Linux Mint ISO has all of the crypt setups. So you don't need to install crypt setup, which is what your first step would be if you don't. So you're gonna do a pseudo crypt setup Lux open, and then you need to know where your encrypted partition is, not your drive, your partition. This is where pseudo fdisk L comes into play. So sudo fdisk L, this is going to give you all of the drives that your system sees and all of their re uh, respective partitions. On this particular case here, when I run that, um, then what I'm actually going to see is it's going to give me um, the drives for, I, like I said, I have a drive which is Cubes and I have a drive which is Linux Mint. The Cubes drive is SDA. The uh, Linux Mint drive is NVMe0N1. And then there's partition one, partition two, partition three. It is partition uh, three is the one that is the encrypted Linux. So we're going to do, uh, in this case here, we're going to do a sudo crypt setup lux open slash dev slash NVMe 0N1P3, and then we're going to mount that to some volume. I simply called it eMint for encrypted mint. That's what I did. And then what we're going to need to do is um, the next step would simply be, oh, you just need to hit the mount and then add this to your file. You'd be wrong. <laughs> because the right now our dry our mint is out it is decrypted however it is not utilizing a mount point system because it's using logical volume management so in order to fix this you need to know where it is and activate the partition so a very nice uh, command lv scan logical volume scan is going to show you all of the individual drives that you have and when you run that, it's going to activate these. So you're going to see an active and then it's going to give you whatever is in there. So this particular drive has a, an encrypted swap partition and an encrypted root partition. And so it maps this to slash uh, dev slash, I think it was VG mint slash boot. And then of course the other one is slash swap. So now we're going to in, uh, mount this making sure of course first that you have the dot uh, the slash mnt available so make that if it's not already there it should be there but go ahead and make it it's not going to hurt anything so now we're going to do a sudo mount slash uh dev slash oh boy uh, what i just said it a minute ago i'll make sure it's correct on the in the notes there uh it should be a slash dev slash um vg mint slash boot and then you're gonna mount that to MNT. All right, so that is actually kind of your first step. And then what you need to do is you need to make sure that you get your boot, your VAR, and your, uh, basically all your different partitions correct because we're setting up a CH root, which is going to allow us to run Grub on the drive instead of running it on the SSD. 
So once you get that guy mounted, the next thing you're going to do is you're going to run this uh, for loop, which is on the um, it's which is on the uh, the uh, help Ubuntu. They are missing a couple steps here. We're going to get to those, and some of those are mentioned in the comments down below, which I saw much later, but they didn't end up being needed. For i in slash sys slash uh, proc slash run slash dev. So this is going to say slash sys slash proc slash run slash dev or all the i variable. For each of those, we're going to ma ma um, mount with a bind those into mnt. So our slash mnt is now going to have a system process run and a dev inside. But what is missing from this is the boot. And that is something else I had to do. So this drive also has, as we saw in running the F disk, two other partitions. Partition one is a 500 megabyte EFI system. And the second one is a 732 Linux file system. And those I grabbed from the other Linux Mint laptop I have just to make sure I knew exactly which one I was doing. The partition two, the 700-ish megabyte drive, goes to boot, and the partition one, the 500-ish megabyte drive, goes to boot slash EFI. So now we're going to do a sudo mount uh, dev nvme0n1p2. We're going to mount that onto our mount point mnt slash boot. So that's slash mnt slash boot. And then we're going to do the sudo apt um, excuse me, not sudo apt, we're going to do a sudo mount slash dev slash nvme0n1p1, mounting that to slash mnt slash boot slash efi. That is the part that's going to tell your system where to go. Now, in the middle of all of this, something might go wrong in your fs tab file. <laughs> or as I like to call it, the fstab file, because I like horror shows. So in that file, we'll tell you which drives go where. This is the one you might need to tweak a few times, and I had to tweak it a few times in this. So you're going to go ahead and check that. And that is actually one of the things that they're telling you. That's kind of down in like step nine. I'm going to go ahead and tell you, check it before you ch root into there. Um, you're, uh, so what you're looking for is uh, BLKID is going to give you the, uh, the IDs of the drive by their code names, not their uh, SDA and VME. So you're going to get a unique identifier for each partition. And you need to make sure that the one booting for EFI matches the one that we mounted to EFI. So that is just going to have to check that and just update it as see fit. Once you get all of those in there, your FS tab is fixed and your mount points for boot and EFI are both in. Now we're going to go in sudo chroot slash MNT. This is going to make sure that you're kind of in a shell inside of this other alternative Linux build. So that's kind of what's going on there. Once you get into there, you might need to install Grub. So you're not going to install it on the dev SDA. You're going to install it onto into dev nvme0n1. You do not install it on a partition. You just tell it to install there just to make sure you need it. And then you're going to do update Grub. Now, this might get you to the point. This is what I had to do to fix the problem where the boot repair system killed the thing based on the cubes drive, which by the way, I took the cubes drive out. I booted into cubes, updated it all, made sure everything works, and then I took the drive entirely out of the computer so it wasn't in the way, it wasn't showing up, it wasn't being probed by the OSs. It was basically, I just didn't want it to be there to make sure that there was nothing else going on. All right, so then what we did is that was actually able to get me over into the, into the computer, but it was causing me a lot of weird problems. So I was able to, once I was able to get there, I was able to get to the grub menu, and then I was able to load into the system. Let's go ahead and talk briefly about that, um, getting into the grub menu. Uh, because what you, we do wanna do is make sure we get into the grub menu. Uh, so 
before you run your grub update or if uh, you know you can run it again with this um, what we want to do is make sure that our grub menu will actually show up since I didn't actually have that set up over here so we're going to edit the file Etsy default grub and then one of the lines you're going to look for is your grub timeout the timeout tells you how long does the menu display before loading the default value all right, so I generally keep mine set at zero for weird reasons, and I've actually changed that to one now because <laughs> zero kind of is what borked my system up entirely. So I changed that to one. Uh, so you're going to want to change it to probably like five or ten or something just so you can get a chance to get in there and uh, see what's going on. So once you have that set up, uh, you set that grub timeout to one, save this file, and then what we are going to do is we're going to run the update grub. This should look through your drive. It should look through your mount partition, which in our particular case here is the NVMe 0N1P2. It's going to find all of those images and then it's going to build a grub menu based on that. And then it's going to install that grub menu onto NVMe 0N1P1. Okay, so that's where it's going to install that too. And then you can reboot your system. And then once I got into there, I was able to do some auto, uh, some auto uh, remove, which did not actually clear out all the Linux kernels. I was able to, from the recovery mode, boot directly into the OS again. And once I was able to boot into the OS, I went into the update manager and then I went ahead and I uninstalled that failed kernel. So it would be completely dead ran the OS Prober again, which wasn't working. Again. Okay, what's the problem? So I go back and I investigate that FS tab file again, and indeed, in the process of fixing it from our live key to running it on the actual computer, the ID of the partition changed. So that is what the final fix was, is to go in, update the FS tab, so it's booting the right thing because what I had noticed is looking at the mount points both in the terminal and in the GUI, the NVMe N1P2 was not actually the one loading into boot. Uh, so I had to get that fixed and once I got that fixed, then that was actually the final fix I needed. I went ahead uh, fix that. I then did sudo rm remove the old systems and then that enabled me to update the kernel properly to the latest kernel and allow a reboot and the entire computer is back entirely to normal. Now there is one more setting that I toggled here. Since my auto remove does not appear to be working, I went over into Linux Mint and in Linux Mint, um, the update manager, there is actually a tab for automation that was added in a few uh, times ago. There is an option there to remove obsolete kernels and dependencies. Now, sudo apt-get auto-remove dash dash purge should clear all that out. But for some reason, it wasn't. I don't know why. So what I did is I turned this on to remove obsolete kernels and dependencies so that hopefully it will solve this problem because this is a problem I've encountered on Linux Mint before. When you have too many kernels appearing, it will fill up that bootloader and it will brick your entire system. That's exactly what I happened here, but I had just enough on here that I did not want to just pull the drive out and put the information, you know, reinstall it and then drop all the data back in. I didn't want to mess with that this time. Now, some people might say, well, you don't like time shift. That would have saved you. No contraire, because everything from the very, very beginning, as soon as I hit the power button, immediately into a kernel panic. That was my problem. No way that time shift was going to fix that. Um, so this long process is actually what I took to fix it. So hopefully as these NVMe SSDs are becoming more standard in laptops, more people might have this problem. Hopefully this guide will help you out. Once again, I will have it linked to the website. Uh, so the link will be in the video description here. You can head on over there and get all of the steps, all the commands, and the brief explanation for what and why. With that, guys, thanks for watching, and I'm very happy to have my Linux Mint 
back up and running exactly as it was, and it only took me about 12 hours. But it should take you only about 20 minutes now that we have the actual steps. So thanks for watching, and I hope that you enjoy switching to Linux. Thank you for watching this video from Switched to Linux. This channel would not be possible without the backing of the program supporters scrolling on the screen now. You can be a supporter at Patreon at patreon.com slash T-O-M-M or at thinklifemedia.com. I also want to thank the open source community who creates such excellent software that makes producing this show possible. Please remember to support your software communities. Thank you, and I hope that you enjoy switching to Linux.